A number of years ago, I was uh, in China. I was walking around the streets of Nanjing, and I was feeling a bit hungry. I was alone. So I found a little fruit stand on the side of the road, and uh, I went to the fruit merchant there, and in my broken Chinese, I asked him if I could have three oranges. And he agreed, and he said, yes, three oranges. And he held up four fingers, and I thought, well, maybe my Chinese isn't as good as I thought it was. So I repeated myself, wo yo san cheng zi ma wu xi. And he said, yes, yes, three oranges. And he held up his finger, and he had, again, four fingers. And I said, no, no, three. And he said, of course, three oranges. One, two, three. <laughs> he counted the space between his fingers rather than his fingers. And of course, I'm an architect, so for me, this was a great moment. My head just flipped over, and I said, wow. <laughs> this fruit merchant knows what he's talking about. And uh, I thought to myself, it's great uh, in this moment when I recognize that he put value in the things that you couldn't see the space between things, the things that we often take advantage of. We are so often trained to imagine value in physical objects and material objects, but often the real value in places lies in those spots, those homes, those homes of, of, of desire that connect the places that we are actually our destinations. And perhaps more so than any other project of ours that this has a special meaning is our reconstruction work at Times Square. We're the first company in about 40 years to receive an approval to build a new master plan for the ground plane and the physical constraints of the walkable and traffic areas of Times Square. Of course, all of us know Times Square in many ways. Uh, it's something that we're uh, familiar with in different manners. Uh, it's got 42 million visitors, over 42 million visitors a year. It's a stunningly challenging place for most people. It's a very odd shape. Uh, we began to compare the shapes of Times Square, this wonderful bow tie, to other uh, places of, of renown in the world. Uh, my favorite in these images is little Piccadilly Circus there in the lower right. A great place to be and how small it is in scale. These are all at the same scale, these little four little images. How small it is in relation to Times Square, yet Times Square is so much more challenging for most people. There's all sorts of characteristics of Times Square that interest us. Of course, there's the on-Broadway moments the off-Broadway moments as we're having here today. There's those things that are above Times Square and of course all of those things that are below Times Square. Times Square is in some ways a kind of iceberg of stuff. A uh, small amount of it is on the surface and a tremendous amount of infrastructure and facilities are below, the, below your feet every time you walk through the space. There are many, many tourists and of course probably more tourists than there are locals uh, because we really don't know <laughs> who the locals are. Uh, sometimes when we meet uh, New Yorkers and we ask them their feeling about Times Square, they say, well, I avoid it like the plague. Uh, whereas if you ask someone from Nebraska, they think it's the most amazing thing on earth. It's a constant place. There are old buildings there. It's a temporary place. There are always events happening. There are a little over 600 events a year in Times Square, outdoor events, some of them related to theater, some related to many other activities. It's a place filled with energy, of course, on New Year's Eve, but it's also a place of eerie calm early in the morning, which is a wonderful um, experience to have, to see Times Square almost quiet. All of those things, the fast and the slow, are, uh, uh, form our understanding of this place, but in many ways, uh, Times Square has lost its balance. And if you look carefully at this image, you'll see that uh, the old Times Square, the Times Square of, of sort of our imagination, had very few marquees. They were right down at the bottom, two or three stories high. And in those days, back in the 20s and 30s, people were smarter and they turned their lights off at night. So you really had this sort of line of light. But over the years, the marquees grew. The marquees grew up higher, and they grew in technology. And they became brighter and faster and more exciting and more dynamic. But the ground plane never grew to match the technology of the marquees. And it became cluttered and difficult to use, and in many ways, a very dangerous place to walk. So the first thing we did was looked at a sort of little square, 10 square feet of space in Times Square and realized there are so many artifacts there that don't need to be there. We could probably just erase most of them and nobody would notice, and it would make it easier to move. So just cleaning up Times Square from the years and years of bureaucracy that has existed there was perhaps our first step in trying to understand how Times Square could be good to New Yorkers as well as tourists. The next thing we noticed 
was that it often floods in Times Square, especially around 45th Street. And we thought, that is just weird, because the engineers have been working on this for years and years, and they haven't been able to solve the problem. It still floods. They've put in all kinds of drains everywhere. So one time we went out to Times Square, and we stood at one end, and we looked across Times Square from one end to the other, south to north, north to south. If you look very closely at this picture, there was something that we recognized after a little time of just staring across the heads of the people. The fact is, the heads of the people form a kind of hammock shape, a little kind of low point. Times Square is not actually flat. It's a kind of a low, sort of swooping form, form, and that's where the rainwater puddles actually appear. And nobody would really noticed it, because most everyone thinks of it as flat. We tried to understand that better, so we looked at some old maps of the topography of Manhattan before the grid was laid. And if you see here inside of this yellow ellipse, amazingly, Times Square sits at the very rare confluence of four creeks. So it's a sump. It's like a sewer. So that's Broadway. <laughs> That's 7th Avenue, and that's some little creek there at 45th. Everything happened right there. And actually, if you just ripped up the streets, this old low point in the topography would still be there. And in fact, it was a place that people generally moved away from as they moved across Manhattan uh, before the grid. <laughs> So rather interestingly, over time, that has changed. So the first thing we then began to do after understanding this sloping surface was micrograde. So we've created, it actually drops a full eight feet in only about four blocks from one end to the middle. So we're micrograding areas to remove the drainage problem. Then we said to ourselves, what's the most important feature of Times Square? Well, of course, it's the people. The people uh, that make Times Square interesting. And we believe that people are not abstractions. Actually, buildings and other structures are. So we need to understand people better. So we spent a lot of time just looking at people. We spent hours and hours photographing people at Times Square. People just sit everywhere that they can find on curbs. They sit on any kind of surface. They, they do things with each other as they wait for their friends or they use their telephone. They might sit in a group around some sort of performer. There's a lot of impromptu performances on Times Square. This was a sad, sad moment where you see an entire school group who have no place to sit but on the street in Times Square, one of the most heavily visited visited tourist points in the world, and they don't have anything to allow them to feel safe or comfortable. But at the same time, you're seeing people using every surface to put stuff. They put cups here, they'll put coffee there, they'll put their drinks and their food down anywhere. We watched this USA Today sign for many, many days. It was used in probably a, over a dozen different ways. People would just use this USA Today sign in any possible way they could find, even taking pictures of their daughter there. So there's something radically interesting about how, how um, ephemeral all of these little, little moments are. We spent a lot of time working with the Department of Transportation, watching how people move around Times Square. This is a model of what I would say is the anger coefficient of people moving <laughs> through Times Square. So everywhere it's red, people are really pissed off. And, that's generally true as you move through the site. Uh, we did some mapping together with the, the city's, uh, uh, the mayor's office and his various departments. This is a map of pedestrian counts throughout the day. Just follow the arrows. That's getting a little later in the day. And that's about 6 o'clock in the evening. There are over 7,000 people crossing one corner of 45th Street in a two-hour period only at that one intersection. So you can imagine this, the pressure on these uh, spaces. People often are pushed off the curb. Some of them actually get hit by cars or buses, so it's a very, very dangerous place to be. We then thought to ourselves, how are we going to solve this problem? And interestingly enough, we looked at uh, one particular author that I've always found interesting. Her name is uh, Temple Grandin. She's, uh, yeah, she's wonderful. I love her work a lot. She's autistic, uh, but she's a, a prolific writer about domestic livestock and livestock behavior. So she looks at cattle on their way to the slaughterhouse. And I always la laughed whenever I read a Temple Grandin book. I always thought to myself, if you replace the word cow with the word human, it still makes perfect sense. Somehow we're self-domesticating creature, self creatures. We, we create uh, lives for ourselves that are domestic. And we move in many ways like livestock. We hate to admit it because we think we're above all that. But in these kind of conditions, we actually do move in an unconscious way. So we started to map how people move through Times Square, the different shops they wanted to go to, and why they wanted to go there, and what was the most direct route that they wanted to take, and how they managed and manipulated themselves around the great bow tie, the crossroads of the world. We realized one day that actually, if you're going to improve 
the way in which people move through a complex space like this, you need to look at Temple Grandin's understanding that is very counterintuitive about behavior in crowds. One of the things that is interesting is that human beings actually respond in a very positive way to things that get in their way. So a great example of that is the kiosk at Grand Central Terminal. Everyone loves to say Grand Central Terminal is wonderful because no one bumps into each other, everybody's nice, and if you compare that to Penn Station, everybody bumps into each other and they hate each other's guts. So why is it that those two places are so different? Well, one of the fascinating aspects of this space in the Great Hall in Grand Central Terminal is this little kiosk. And the fact that it's there in the center means that everyone has to navigate around it. So you've got the same roadblock in your way as everybody else. And since you're all trying to get around the same thing in the same way, you're generally a little politer because you know everyone's in the same boat trying to get around this kiosk. If you were to take that kiosk away and leave it completely open, everyone would take the shortest route from one side of the hall to the other, all headed for the center. We'd all bump into each other and be pissed off because that's my space, not yours. And then you'd get angry. So this little kiosk creates a kind of degree of politeness. And we thought to do that at Times Square. So we started actually to design in little rocks where flow would happen across uh, the site, where people would meander around particular aspects of the design in a very counterintuitive way. We also looked at daylight. It's wonderful. These are daylight sunlight studies we made of Times Square. This is at December at 1 o'clock, and the sun shoots right up Broadway. If you stand in that spot at 45th Street, one hour later, the sun will shoot right up 7th Avenue. And of course, during the summer in June, you get these wonderful moments they call Manhattan Henge, where the sun sets uh, over, uh, over the cross streets. So we wanted also to work with daylight. In our new design, we've created these tiny little stainless steel pucks that sit into the ground plane, and they reflect the sunlight as you move across it. We're not adding, actually, artificial light to Times Square. We want the marquees to be the primary goal of what people experience there. But we wanted to reflect that light into the ground. And these little tiny pucks are lined up across Times Square in such a way that you see them twinkle as you move uh, along Broadway and towards 7th Avenue. These are some of the mock-ups that we made with the little uh, pucks of, uh, in, inside of the, the panels that we're going to be laying into the street. We also wove them together in such a way that you'd be aware of both 7th Avenue and Broadway. And we're literally taking traffic permanently off of Broadway between 42nd and 47th Street. And all that space will be given over and dedicated to people uh, to be able to breathe freely as they move across Times Square. These uh, particular spaces are also fitted out in a beautiful way with very big solid concrete, uh, stone curbs and a wonderful kind of pattern that helps you orient yourself as you move through the square. There's a lot of big events that occur out there from like mass yoga exercises to crazy rodeo events. Uh, who knows what uh, people will come up with uh, to, to, uh, to sort of occur out there. But most importantly, then we want to make those shows, those impromptu shows in Times Square work effectively so that Times Square can be the lobby, the theater lobby for the theater district. So we in, in, involved actually these little bench designs. We created these amazing benches which uh, allow for people to collect in groups and allow for other people like New Yorkers who are in a hurry to move quickly along the edges of the building. And those benches themselves have built-in infrastructure, transmission facilities, optical fiber so you don't have to draw, drag uh, uh, temporary machinery out onto Times Square. It's all built into these amazing benches. The benches are designed to allow people to sit in different ways, to be comfortable. They have a little bit of a character of that noir era of, uh, that some of us imagine of Times Square. They're about 50 feet long and about five feet wide. You can do all kinds of things on them. I don't know what's going to happen on those benches, but I'm sure it's going to be some interesting <laughs> things. Then we built a mock-up. This is a foam mock-up that we made, and that mock-up was uh, just set up temporarily. As soon as we removed the barricades around the mock-up, just people started to occupy the bench, doing weird things like standing on it and looking at it. So I suspect this will grow over time. New Yorker heard about some of our thoughts working with Temple Grandin, I think, that somehow we were going to make a no tourist lane and a tourist lane, and somehow we were going to make Times Square into a, a hunting ground for bison. So I suppose this is a, 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 an option of some of our thoughts. I thought it was kind of fun. So to conclude, we're going to change Times Square from this to this. It'll be a great place for people to just hang out in different ways and, and uh, talk to their friends and meet people on their way to a show. It'll go from this to this. 
uh, alongside the existing TKTS, uh, beautiful amphitheater that's there. That's an amazing place to be. So overview of the spaces along Broadway here with 7th Avenue still having traffic. We're actually increasing the speed of traffic because we're removing traffic lights uh, from Times Square, which is also important. Uh, so that's actually a, a, a physical, a, a, a photograph of some of the uh, areas that are under construction now. We're moving block by block. Um, we've created, I think, which might be the world's only on foot traffic jam, which right now, I'm sorry, please forgive us, but it's a real pain in the butt. I know it takes 20 minutes to get from 42nd to 43rd because of our construction on foot, uh, but this will be all over soon. That's a detail of one of the traffic jams of people. Um, but we're working as fast as we can. We're undoing 200 years of redundant infrastructure that was placed there by uh, overlapping bureaucrats. These are some of the beautiful stone. These are solid granite curbs that will go in on the corners of the streets. They're being laid now in a beautiful way. It's a great team working out there. They're working through the winter, through the cold weather to make sure that it happens quickly enough. And of course, we're seeing all kinds of odd things. What would, what would Times Square be without something strange happening even during construction? So Snooky and Jay Wow are uh, very proud of this. I, I like sometimes early in the morning to see when it's very quiet, the pigeons uh, just sort of sitting there. And finally, uh, just to say, you know, who is this guy in the silver uh, outfit watching the construction workers? I was very afraid he was going to get struck by lightning or something like that. Um, but uh, every day that we go out there and we see this space, we're hopeful and very proud of the fact that we believe in the future, in the not so distant future, you'll have Times Square back again as a great place uh, for the district. So thank you very much.